So what is sensation and perception? And I want to read a quote from William James, who is a famous you know, psychologist who wrote The Principles of Psychology, who was a, you know, the founder of the, the functionalist approach in psychology, um, heavily influenced by Darwin. Like, what is the you know, sort of adaptive purpose of behavior, for example? And um, he wrote, uh, whilst part of what we per perceive comes through the senses uh, from the object before us, another part, and it may be the larger part, always comes out of our own mind. So I, I take this to mean, you know, there's a distinction, you know, between sensory detection, like the actual stimulus striking some sort of specialized neuron that is, you know, designed to respond, you know, to touch or to pressure or, you know, to, you know, uh, vi uh, electromagnetic radiation that comes in the eye or to sound waves, etc., you know, all sort of chemicals that are in the body or that you breathe into your nose or that dissolve upon your tongue. There is specialized sensory detection equipment. Um, these are specialized neurons that actually express different genes, you know, that make them responsive to this kind of stimulus or that, but not to everything else, right? So you do have these specialized sensory detection systems that are arrayed throughout your body, right? Um, and yet, um, just the detection is not necessarily enough to support a perceptual experience, a conscious perceptual experience. That requires the routing of that, you know, sensory detection. And, you know, neurons carry information electrically. So, you know, detection of a particular type of energy must lead in that specialized neuron, you know, to some kind of what we call an action potential, which works its way back, you know, towards the central nervous system. And then it will get routed along you know, uh, uh, networked connections of neurons uh, that will ultimately support, you know, our perceptual experiences uh, of that sensory detection event. This is an interesting thing to consider, right? Because it suggests that you can actually have perceptual experiences perhaps in the absence of actual sensory detection. Because once you have the architecture, you know, here, you can sort of play out to some extent, you know, various scenarios that have, you know, colors and uh, felt, ex felt experiences and, um, you know, other aspects of, you know, our perceptual uh, abilities. So perception serves a purpose, right? So for example, if you um, cut your finger, right, you damage tissue. You, you actually cut through cell membranes, which, which are now split. So all of those proteins that cells produce are now free to sort of exit into the surrounding or what we call the extracellular space. And there are selective specialized neurons that actually can bind, you know, some of these released proteins. They have their own proteins, you know, that are not expressed by other neurons or other cells in the area, but by just these specialized neurons. They're actually called, they've got a fancy name, they're called nociceptors. Uh, they, they, they detect tissue damage. They bind proteins released from damaged cells and that initiates a current called an action potential which works its way back along this very long you know, sensory neuron, this very long nociceptor back into the, the, the spinal cord. And in the spinal cord, you know, there's going to be a, an interneuron, like a synapse with another neuron, what they call an interneuron, because it's, remember it's between you know, the afferent or sensory input and the motor or efferent output. And then um, it'll signal you know, another action potential you know, to go out to the muscle and to help you withdraw the limb from the source of injury, right? So this is actually an example of a sensory detection event. You know, you're detecting a stimulus, right? A specialized stimulus using a specialized neuron, you know, transmitting that information back. But there is sort of a reflexive, you know, withdrawal response. It's an adaptive, you know, functional response, actually. Uh, but whether it's, um, you know, per it's not perceived at that particular level, the actual perception you know, of the, of the injury, of the pain and the withdrawal, you know, the response to the pain, et cetera, is going to rely on information at these higher levels of the nervous system. So I, I actually think pain is a good kind of, um, kind of uh, uh, topic to sort of um, delve into when we're trying to make this distinction between um, sensory detection, you know, which is occurring, you know, at these neurons in the body, you know, that are specialized to respond to certain kinds of energy, both, you know, uh, external, you know, coming, touching you, for example, and internal things that are inside too. You've got lots of specialized sensory equipment that is, you know, arrayed throughout the interior portion of your body. 
um, and these higher level networks that are essential for perceptual experience. So if you think about the nociceptive input, you've damaged tissue, right? You set off a current, you've now, you know, sent a reflexive response back, so you withdraw, that's very functional, very adaptive. Um, you continue to send this information up into the brain stem where it will, you know, activate a number of networks that'll shift your head, neck, and eyes down to the source of the actual injury, right? So you're now oriented. This is called an orienting response. Still, you're not particularly conscious of the perceptual experience of the pain. But the other thing it does in the brainstem, this information, and this remember, it's coming up electrically along these neuron wires, is it's going to, you know, promote the release of a lot of chemicals throughout your cerebrum. Um, these are important neurotransmitters, right? Um, they are communicating at the synapse between one neuron and the next. And you may have heard of some of these. They include dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin. They, they actually share um, a kind of modulatory ro role in terms of how alert or awake or aroused you actually happen to be. So you're, you know, the, you've cut yourself, you've now withdrawn your limb, and now you're oriented, and now you're also a little more awake, right? And then this information continues to ascend and gets mapped in a sp particular portion of the brain. No susceptive information, information about tissue damage from the body is pretty emotionally salient. So the primary sort of cortical mapping site where it first arrives in cortex is actually going to be in the insular lobe. That maps a lot of the internal state of the body and a lot of significant emotionally salient kind of protective, you know, um, uh, uh, perceptual experiences. Um, and this is uh, a lobe that appears to be pretty critical for the support of your perceptual experience of the pain. Now, this information in this map region gets distributed, you know, along other networks in your cortex, right, in your brain, um, including into areas of the frontal lobe, which are important for social decision making. So you can, you know, evaluate like why why was whatever cut you there. You can sort of it goes into networks that are involved in, you know, memory. So you can think about, you know, the, the, what happened before. You know, is this something I should be thinking about then planning for the future? You use your frontal lobe. So all these things, this this information gets, you know, distributed in different, you know, directions and has different sort of conscious perceptual consequences, right? But there is a pretty clear distinction between sensory uh, detection and the perceptual networks, uh, the networks in the brain that are involved in perceptual experience.